Well, we're back in a series of Philippians chapter 3, the book of Philippians called Joy from Jail. Love that title, Joy from Jail. The apostle Paul was in prison at Rome. He was either waiting his exoneration or his execution. He didn't know which. He was either going to be set free or he was going to be killed. He had actually put himself in that position. It wasn't anybody that put him there. He would put himself in that position because he, as he preached the gospel, it seemed like that as he preached, there was more riots occurring among the Jewish people than revival. And the Jewish people just, just hated Paul because he preached this gospel that didn't fit in their religious system. And so he was just, they just hated him. And so he would preach the truth and cause a riot. And as a result of that, finally he was in so many courts and they just kept deferring him to another, a higher court. And finally Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. And so they said, well, that's where you'll go. So he's in Rome. He has the freedom to receive visitors. He has the freedom to write. And so he begins to write to all the different churches that he had started during his missionary journeys. And one of those was the church in Philippi, which we're looking at today. We have uh, done, I, I think in January, four messages so far, if I recall, in Philippians 1 and 2. And today we're going to look at chapter 3. We've uh, preached on First Fruits. We had a guest speaker in last week. Did you enjoy the guest speaker? Over the weekend, wow, yeah, that was still, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, receiving from that one. Definitely a weekend to remember, as I called it. And today we're going to look in um, Philippians chapter 3. You have your Bibles or devices, you can open up to Philippians chapter 3. And I've entitled the message, The Ultimate Joy. The Ultimate Joy. One of the, two of the themes, rather, that we've encountered so far is that God has begun a good work in you. You may not believe it, you may not see it yet, but God has begun a good work in you and he will bring it to completion in his time and his play. We just need to hang in there, persevere, keep looking to him and he will turn it around for good. That's what he promises. So that's one of the themes that Paul has so far in the book. The second reoccurring theme is joy. Paul's circumstances do not determine his joy. His joy is infused in every circumstance that he's in, everything he thinks, every hardship. God's joy is infused into it, and it just reoccurs over and over and over again. And I think we could uh, all handle a dose of joy right now, right? Because we need it. In 2006, there was a movie that was put out called The Ultimate Gift. I don't know if you've seen that or... Uh, it's actually uh, worth a good watch, but the story surrounds a young adult. His name is Jason. He is spoiled, rich guy. I mean, his grandfather had money, his parents had money, and he was just living the life. And he was being very self-centered and selfish. He didn't care about anybody else but him. And his grandfather died. And so the whole family gathered for the will. And they thought that it would be distributed among uh, all equal. But the grandfather decided that he would give his entire inheritance to Jason. With one exception. He had to pass 12 tests to get the ultimate gift. His grandfather called them 12 gifts that he had never experienced through his life. Jason had a, a decision at that point when he realized what was before him. Will he enter in to gain the ultimate gift in the end or will he not and walk away and just continue his self-centered lifestyle? He had a choice to make. The other thing that was in the bargain of this on the journey to the ultimate gift is at any time he would stop. He, he could have been on gift five and said, I'm done. I'm, I'm, this, is, this is ludicrous. Even up to gift 10 or 11, before he got the ultimate, he could have stopped and he would not have received the ultimate gift. That was in the setup of how the grandfather arranged it. Well, I'm not going to tell you the end of the story. 
You'll have to watch it if you like, or maybe there's a book out there. But at the end of the trailer, the grandfather who is transmitting this on video, he had passed away. He's giving all the instructions on video to his grandson. He says this. He said, you don't begin to live until you've lost everything. You don't begin to live until you've lost everything. That's kind of hard for us to hear, and perhaps there's an adaptation of that. But as I read Philippians chapter 3, I would say that the Apostle Paul would agree with that. He said, I didn't start living until I transferred all that I thought was bringing me joy and all that I thought was what was helping me be significant in this life. I was trying to do all what I knew, but then I met Jesus, the ultimate gift, the ultimate joy, and I realized that everything that I had tried up to that point didn't matter was worthless, didn't count. Knowing Jesus did. So open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read three sections. I'm, my goal is to get all the way through the chapter today. We'll see how it goes. See how we get along. Here we go. First eight verses. Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. There he goes, rejoicing again. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcised, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, and as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. What a passage of Scripture. The first thing that I want us to look at and begin, number one, is to be aware of fake joy. We've heard a lot about fake news, right? But there's also a fake joy out there. And Paul says, I want you to be aware of what fake joy is in your life. The New Living, New Living Translation says, uh, verse 7, says this, I once thought all these things were so very important, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Paul starts out in verse 1, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. In verse 2, now he changes his tone. Mild-mannered, meek Paul all of a sudden rises up and says, be aware. Be, he calls them dogs. I mean, he, he's really labeling these people as, he says, mutilators of the flesh. Wow, Paul is really getting out there. He's getting descriptive. But what is he really talking about? Well, in this case, he's talking about circumcision. What was happening is the Jewish Christians added to faith in Christ. They no longer said that, that you receive God, have right standing with God only by faith. He says you've got to add something to it. You have to be circumcised in order to be fully born again. That was the issue that was happening here. That's what the Jewish Christians said. That's what the Jewish leaders said. And Paul said, no, that's not how I received it from Christ. That's not how he taught me. You simply receive God. You're born again simply by faith. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, you say, well, how does that apply today? Well, you have 
churches today, mainly denominations, and it wouldn't have to be denominations necessarily, that say that in order to be a part of our group, you have to believe these certain things. While it's good to have good doctrine, sometimes the doctrine of men creeps in and becomes the doctrine of God. For instance, there's a segment of Christianity that says that you have to be baptized in water before you are fully born again. And if you're not baptized in water, then you're not fully born again. There's a sect of Christianity that says that, and yet what have they just done? They've added to faith, and they've made it into works. You have to do these works, or you're not fully born again. Now, being water baptized is a great thing. I call that the first step of obedience, but that's now how how a person gets saved. That's now how a person becomes born again. It's simply by faith. Therefore, anyone can qualify and anyone can come in. It's not something that we do. Again, what was happening is that they were saying that you had to add to. Now, Paul says, man, if you want to talk about diplomas and trophies and and ribbons that I've gotten for being the best, I can beat you all. And he goes through his list. He goes through his list. He said, "I, I was circumcised according to the law. I am a Jew by birth. I've traced my lineage back to the tribe of Benjamin. I was at the top of my class in Jewish theology. I became a leader in the Pharisee sect. And he said, I, I was, I was, because I was so zealous for what I knew, I persecuted those people that called themselves Christians. I kept the law flawlessly, therefore I'm righteous. Wow. That's what Paul believed before he met Jesus. He thought it was about his works. He thought it was about things that he could do that would make him righteous with God, and that's simply not the case. Paul's telling, reminding this Philippian church and reminding us it's by faith. It's not what we do, it's where we, what we believe in. And so his confidence were in those things that I just listed. Those were his trophies. You walk into Paul's office and and, and before Christ, he would have shown you, you know, I was at the top of my class here and and here's my lineage here. I did Ancestry.com and I'm a Jew. And and, and he would go down through thinking that when he showed you all his trophies and all his diplomas and all that he did and all the accolades that he got, that you would think, wow, Paul, you really are somebody. God must really love you. But the fact is, Paul had yet, to enter in to believe in Christ by faith. And so all those things didn't matter. He came to the realization of that. And that can flow into our life sometimes. Sometimes we think, man, I I, I missed reading my Bible on Thursday and I missed church last week and I really flew off the handle and a cuss word slipped out. Oh my gracious, now God loves me less. God's love meter hasn't moved on you. Didn't even flinch. And yet we ourselves can get into this works-based, if I, since I didn't do, God loves me less. It's a lie. It creeps in. No, his love stays the same. Now, in the world, let me qualify. In the kingdom of God, our works or those things that we do to try to earn merit or gain credibility with God, they, they don't matter. They're worthless. But in the world, sometimes they do matter. You're going to, sometimes you can't get a job in this world unless you have a certain degree. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to go to a surgeon that puts his shingle out in front of his office and say, well, you work on me and, you know, do, do your surgery unless you first know that he's been through, you know, I don't know, a zillion years of school, watched surgeries, had somebody mentor him before he works on you. Oh, it doesn't matter. I just put out my shingle and here, I'll operate on you. You go, no way. It does matter. Paul even used the fact that he was a Roman citizen to get justice in one case. So it did matter in this world, but it doesn't matter in that world. It doesn't matter 
in that kingdom. And sometimes we get the two mixed up. Paul says, I put no confidence in the flesh. That's what it means to put confidence in the flesh. That we do things in this life to think that we gain credibility with God or his love. Works salvation is worthless. All right? It's worthless. However, works do matter. You're like, uh, what are you saying, Pastor? You're confusing me. No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter for us to be born again. But after we're born again, it does matter. I think about marriage. Those of you that are, that are married, or if you're not, you probably can relate this to relationships. You don't work to get married. You agree to get married. Now, some of you put in a lot of work that day. You got married. But you don't work to get married. You agree to get married, right? Okay. So that's like being born again. You agree with God that you're a sinner and you need to be saved. You agree with him. Now, just like in a marriage, you agreed to get married. But if you're going to have a good marriage, there's some things you've got to work out. Right? It takes work to work out those things. And if you don't work on your marriage, it's going to deteriorate and you'll be knocking on the door of divorce. And you don't want that. God doesn't want that. That's not life-giving. And so we have to recognize that we agreed to get married, but after we agreed to get married, it's going to take some work to work things out and make it better. I liken it this way. I think that when we get married, we bring two streams into this relationship. Actually, uh, if you've ever flown over Grand Junction, Colorado, you will see the Red River and the Green River come together. That's why they call it Grand Junction. And the Green River is actually green, and the Red River is actually red. And at Grand Junction, Colorado, when you fly over, you will see this place where the two rivers come together. And for a period of time, you will see green and red side by side flowing in the same river banks. But then about a mile or two down the road, it all gets mixed up and you see one color. That's like marriage. You bring in two streams of, of how you think should be, things should be done and, and your family of origin. You bring that together and then you work at it and you work at it. I don't know. I, this is my opinion. I think it takes up to 10 to 15 years until you actually take those streams and actually they become one in a way that is actually great and good. I don't know if that's encourage you or disappoint you. But I, it, I'm just telling you, it takes a while working it out. And Paul says that works are important, but not to get saved. After we get saved, they're a blessing to us. The next thing that I, uh, I want to look at is get fixed on the ultimate joy. Paul said, I want you to get fixed on the ultimate joy. We're going to pick up in verse 8 and read down through 11. What is more, I consider everything a loss to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes through God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. What Paul begins to unfold here before us is the ultimate joy of living. The ultimate joy of living. I don't know what you would consider the ultimate joy of of living is. I watched this uh, movie recently about a, a lady that uh, purchased three camels and walked across Australia. And at one point, she had a black lab with her, and at one point, the, the dog died, okay? She's in grief. She's laying down and looking up at the stars, and she says, the greatest in the world is this, hope, jokes, and dogs, and the greatest of these is dogs. 
Well, she started out a little biblical, but she got a little bit off track. But I guess that was meaningful to her, the ultimate joy in life. The Message Bible says it this way. It says, I give up all that inferior stuff so that I may know Christ personally. I give up all that inferior stuff so that I may know Christ personally. What does it mean to know Christ? That's the question. See, sometimes today we ask one another, do you know that person? Oh yeah, I saw them on the news last night. I know them. Do you know that person? Oh yeah, I read their book. I know them. Do you know that person? Yeah, I had a conversation downtown yesterday with them. I know them. Do you know that person? Yeah, my sister's brother-in-law went to school with them. I know them. Is that knowing Christ? No, I don't think so. The word, if you look it up, the word knowing here means what takes place between a man and a woman in the bedroom. That's the knowing of what Paul is talking about. Knowing Christ. Now obviously, uh, we can know someone without being in the bedroom with them. But that's the, that's the essence of what the word carries. It's not an acquaintance. It's not, I had a conversation with them. It is way deeper and more intimate than that. And that's the ultimate joy for Paul. He said, I want to know Christ. So how do, we, how do we get to that level? Paul says this. He says, in, and he starts out and he says this. At the end of verse 8, he says, um, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, just to gain Christ doesn't mean that we know him. Just to say a prayer, to say, I'm turning my life over to Jesus, doesn't mean that we know him. That's a starting place, but it doesn't mean that we really know him. And then the next thing he says is not just gain Christ, but to be found in him. In other words, if somebody would ask you, are you a Christian? You would say, yes, I'm a Christian. I am found in him. Paul says that it's way more deeper than that. Not just to gain him, not just to know I'm found in him, but you come to the place where you say, I know him personally. It's a whole different progression there. And it all happens by faith. It all happens by faith. We start by faith, we continue in faith, and we end in faith. The works that we do doesn't bring us faith. The works that we do only reflect our faith. Works don't bring us faith. Works reflect our faith. I don't, I, don't, I don't work because I'm married. I won't work on my marriage to have, because I'm married. I work because I want a better one. I want to know Wanda personally. Even though we've been married 32 years. Is that right, honey? 32 years? Yes, she says, 32. Sometimes I'm having such a great time, I lose track. Paul says these four areas, he says there's four areas that we can enter into experientially and when we come out of those four areas, we will know Christ personally. Are you ready? Okay, I'm not sure you're ready. You'll probably like a few of these and when we get halfway through, you'll go, whoa. This is what Paul says. Let me, let me read it from the, the message translation and uh, kind of start again. There, I gave up all these inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally. And then he picks up and he says this in, in at the end of 10 and 11. Experiencing his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, go all the way with him to death itself, and if there's a way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I want to do that too. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Well, let's start with resurrection power, which is different from coming back from the dead. Resurrection power is simply something in some way that God has transformed your life. That's what resurrection power is. 
And if we don't experience Christ in that way, then what good is it? If he doesn't come and change our life, when, that's resurrection power. So it's the same power that lives in us, raised Christ Jesus from the dead. We have incredible ability within us. And Paul said to know Christ, you experience his resurrection power. I prayed with a friend of mine to just be filled with the Holy Spirit recently. And after three weeks, they gave me a testimony. And they said, you know, you prayed for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I never thought about it before. I never, never considered it before. But, but you prayed for me, and there's three distinct things that happen. I am calmer than I used to be. I have more peace than I used to have. And I have stopped people-pleasing. That's transformational power, folks. I mean, you live for a long period of time and you get in this groove and you think there's no hope and there's no way out and suddenly God comes in and says, no, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to sacrifice in that way. No, you can be free. And that's what Jesus brought. That's a part of knowing him is experiencing his resurrection, his transformational power, changing habits, breaking addictions, Healing our bodies, restoring relationships is all about transformational power. And when we experience those things, we start knowing Christ personally. The next one is partnering with the suffering of Jesus. Uh Uh-oh. Partnering with the suffering of Jesus. You know, you don't really know someone until you suffer with them. You don't, you don't have to do the suffering, but when you journey with somebody suffering, you find out exactly who they are. And I think we need to understand that, that sometimes we need to enter into the sufferings of Jesus. Sometimes we don't even realize that we're there. For instance, we don't really relate to the physical sufferings of Jesus in this nation other nations would. I don't know if you remember the guest speaker last week he had a Bible college in Pakistan and he showed us those graduates and he said one third of those will be in jail. And see, we don't, we don't really think that way in our nation. Hopefully we won't get there yet. Who knows? But we don't really think that way. We don't really relate to those kind of sufferings but there's places in the world that would and do. So what kind of sufferings would we enter into with Christ? Well, the sufferings that we would enter to enter in with Christ would probably be more in the emotional realm. And let me give you an example of what, how he suffered emotionally, and then you can ask yourself, have I ever suffered in that way? He was alone. He suffered alone. Have you ever been alone? You've entered into the sufferings of Christ. He was mocked. You ever been mocked for what you believe? If you've been mocked and you stood up for the truth, you've entered the sufferings of Jesus. He was wrongly accused. He always had the truth. Wrongly accused. You ever been wrongly accused? Misunderstanding? You've entered in the sufferings of Christ. He was abandoned. You ever been abandoned? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But if you have, real abandonment, you've entered in the sufferings of Christ. He was, wow, here's a biggie. He was rejected by leaders and people alike. Leaders rejected him. Ever had that happen to you? You've entered in the sufferings of Christ. He was tempted in every way that you are. I don't know how you're tempted. You don't know how I'm tempted. We're all tempted in different ways, but he was tempted tempted in every way that you and I are. And so if you suffer by being tempted, you've entered the sufferings of Christ. People treated him unjustly. You ever been treated unjustly? If so, you've entered the sufferings of Christ. Sometimes we don't get to that level and think, wow, 
Sometimes we, we look at it from the standpoint of, of, of how we feel about it or how the world tells us we should respond. And we don't stop and think, wait a minute, I'm identifying with the sufferings of Jesus. I can get through this. I can have joy in the midst of it. I can, I, I, I can learn from this. The other thing that we don't really think about is, is that, that Jesus suffered spiritually. I'm coming back. Nice water, isn't it? Full glass. Jesus suffered spiritually because the human race had a problem. We've got a problem in our heart and it prevents us from having right standing with God. There's something in the way. So we go through life and we, we do things that don't please God. Yet we think, it doesn't matter. Get away with it. So that which we came in with starts to get a little bit tainted. And we think, eh, it's okay. Then something else happens. Broken relationship. More poison into our heart. We're like, eh, I think I can make it through that. Then something else happens. We get more poisoned. We think, I think God's against me. It's not really for me. And then the ultimate, we're like, I know God hates me. And our heart is filled up full of total darkness. And God the Father said, this is humanity's heart. This is where it's gotten to. And he said, I need somebody. I need somebody that is, that is perfect, fully God, fully man, to drink that cup. That was separating. Whoever drinks that cup will then remove the barrier. And I can enter in relationship with God. No barriers by faith. Jesus said, I'll drink that. That was the cross. He fixed it. There's an additional illustration I could use, but I'll save it for another time. You see, there was a barrier between us and God. That's what our hearts looked like. Jesus said, I'll drink that. Removed it out of the way. See why it's ultimate joy? Whew. When Paul got a hold of the fact that all his confidence in the flesh looked like that. And that Jesus drank it for him and removed it from him. He's like, there's nothing else that matters besides knowing Christ. Nothing else that matters. That's the ultimate joy is knowing Christ. Oh, we're just on the second one. <laughs> Let's keep rolling. Paul said this, you want to know Christ? He says, I'm willing to go all the way to death itself. In other words, I'm, if somebody says, deny Christ and I won't kill you, he says, I can't do that. I need to say, I will not deny my Lord and Savior. I will go to the death they love like not their lives even unto death. 
And he said, if you're willing to do that, you will know Christ personally when you make that decision that you're willing to do that. Again, we're not faced at that level with that kind of decision in our nation, but there's other places in the world that are right now. And then Paul stretches this even further. He said, I am physically willing to die so I can be raised from the dead if that would help me know Christ to the fullest. You're like, wow, really? Yes. So you want to know Christ personally? Again, you sum it up in these four things. Have you experienced his transforming power? He's changed your life. That's what knowing Christ is. It's not a prayer and living life as normal or as usual. No, it's knowing that God has come to live inside of me and now I'm different. I'm a new creation. I'm born again. I have access to God freely. There's nothing in the way. And then he says, are you willing to suffer with me to get to know me better? Again, I mentioned you don't really know somebody until you suffer with them. We had a, this lady that uh, used to, she was a part of Crossroads, and then she got married and moved. But she was, she was great. She, uh, she loved cats. Okay, if you don't like cats, just stick with me here. Hang with me. Appreciate me. But uh, she was just, uh, she had a piece of property, and if people would lose pets, she would invite them to come over and bury their pets in the back of her yard. I mean, it was just, it was just great. But the thing that she did was that, that when she, when you brought, you know, your dead, I, is this okay? I guess. When you brought your dead pet over, you, you know, she wouldn't, she wouldn't just say, oh, you know, go back there and bury it. She, she's just like, I want to know the story. And she would end up crying with you, with your dead cat. I mean, entering into suffering. I know that's a lame example, but, you know, that's what cats deserve. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. For, I, I have a cat now, right? now. I have a great cat, so I'm not against cats, but... It's just, you know, it wasn't about just bearing the animal. It's just like, I'm going to suffer with you. <laughs> I'm going to cry with you over this animal. That we enter in to say, Jesus, how would you, how you must have felt emotionally during that time. And it gives us hope that whatever we're suffering, that we can walk through. Let's move on. Number three, keep fixed on Jesus. To keep fixed on Jesus, we must practice catch and release. Any fishermen in the house? I know a few. Catch and release. He says this. I love Paul. He's just such a realist. I mean, after he talked about this heavy thing of knowing Christ, he comes back around. He said, I'm not there yet. Of all people, we would think that Paul would say, and I've arrived and what's your problem? Not him. He says this. Not that I have already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I practice catch and release. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul said, you know, you want to work this thing, you got to practice catch and release. you got to let go of some things and you got to take hold of other things. Pretend for a moment that this is me or this is you and then this is God. I just, just work with me. If you got two arms this morning, just put them up like this. And the left is you and the right is God. Paul says, this is how I work it. He says, I know that on the right is God. He has taken hold of me. Go ahead and do that. Take, take your right hand and put it on your left hand. He says, I know that God's taken hold of me. And he says, I'm going to make a decision to take hold of him. I'm going to take hold of him too. Not just him holding on me and I'm, I'm here floating around looking for whatever can build me up in the flesh to think that I can look better and get better. I'm grabbing a hold of other things. No, I'm going to let go of those things and I'm going to take hold of God because he has taken hold of me we got to let go of some stuff in order to take hold of God. Amen. So catch and release. That's what 
That's what, but what did he leave behind? He left behind all those accomplishments in the flesh that I read in verses 4 through 6. He left those things behind. He wasn't building that anymore. They didn't mean anything to him. Oftentimes when we read this verse, we think about past sins that are visiting us today. And that may be true, but that's not what Paul had in mind. He had in mind all those things that he thought were going to bring him closer to God. It wasn't necessarily sins he's committed, even though uh, some of them were, obviously. Some of them were just who he was. He was a Jew, and he was the top of his class, and, and, and he had been circumcised at eight days old. Some of those were just facts. But he, he actually said, no, all of that stuff is rubbish. It's garbage. Some translations say it's dung. I mean, he really, he really went to the lowest level to say, that's what it is, and therefore I'm leaving it behind. So he's leaving behind this confidence in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says this, Take captive every thought and bring it into obedience to Christ. Do you do that? Do I do that? <laughs> no. Yet when I think about it, I do. Take captive every thought and bring it into obedience to Christ. What is the goal worth getting? Knowing Christ. I want you to walk out of the day and you think about the ultimate joy. What is the ultimate joy? Knowing Christ. What is the ultimate joy? Say it again. One more time. That's the ultimate joy in life, is knowing Christ. The world can take a hold of us. This word, take hold, literally means to apprehend. If a criminal's on the loose, what happens? The police catch him. What do we call that? Apprehended. Paul says, I've been apprehended by Christ. It's no longer me that live. I've been apprehended, and so I apprehend him. I take hold of him just like he apprehended me. I apprehend, apprehend him. <laughs> little tongue twister there. Jesus said, or Paul said, you know, that's the way I want to live my life. All right, let's finish up. Wind down here. Number four is to be an example for Jesus. When I first wrote that point, I said, be an example for others. And then all of a sudden, it felt like the Spirit stopped me and said, no, you don't want to be an example for others. You want to be an example for Jesus. And when you're an example for Jesus, then others will benefit greatly. But staying an example for others puts it on their plane. Well, you've got to please them. No, it's not about pleasing them. It's about pleasing Jesus. And then as a result, others will benefit. Let me read 15 through 21. He says, All of us who are mature should take a view of such things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say it again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is their destruction, and their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Hallelujah. So Paul is taking this chapter from an individual viewpoint now to a corporate view. And he's saying this. He's saying that I want you to example your life so that Jesus would be pleased and others will benefit. He says, join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of other people who are living according to the pattern." You see, patterns are important. People make patterns so that they can be transferred to other people who can read the pattern and then build the structure or put together the item or make the food in the recipe. You know, a blueprint 
is given to the, the construction worker and then the, the workers build the house. It's a pattern. A recipe is a pattern. Some of you are like, really? <laughs> we need instructions when we order something online and it comes in the mail and we have to put it together. However, <laughs> usually the person that wrote the instructions that you're trying to put together never put it together, right? <laughs> That's why we have YouTube. Helps us out of a jam. So Paul says, it's not just a, a way to live, it's a pattern that then other people can see your life. So I have a couple of questions. And that is, is your life pattern, the way that you live your life, as others look at your life, would they go, oh yeah, that reflects Christ? Or would they go, I'm really confused here. That person says that they know Christ, but how they're living and how they're exhibiting doesn't seem to line up. See, I've, I've, I've had people tell me about others, and this was years ago, and someone out in the community, and, and they were like, that person comes to your church? I was like, yeah, why? <laughs> I had no idea they were a church person. I'm like, oh, we got problems here. Paul says this. He says that those of us who are mature should think a certain way. And here's my point. Maturing people are always those who look up to God and forward to a different future. Those who are maturing in Christ are always looking up and they're looking forward. Those who are not maturing in Christ are always looking in the past and they're locked in the present. And so the question is, how are you living? Are you, when you encounter a problem or a barrier, do you look to God to solve it? Do you pray? Do you ask God? Do you dig into His Word and look towards a, towards a different future? Or are you always looking in the past? Oh, I never got it right then. I won't get it right now. Oh, that person will never change. They'll never change now. If you always are digging in the past and trying to bring it in and stuck in the future, you are not maturing. Mature people look to God and they begin to see a different future. That's what it means to mature in Christ. And Paul calls us as a church to do that for each other. Let me just recap here. If you want to pursue the ultimate joy of knowing Christ, then you must disregard thinking that your earthly accomplishments will cause you to get closer to God. They might matter in this world, but they don't matter in His world. To know Christ means that we enter His world. We experience what He offers. Resurrection power. Suffering for a purpose. Being so convinced that we would die for our faith in Him and being willing to die even to the point that we would be raised back to dead, from the dead. We practice catch and release. Catch hold of Christ, release the past because He's taken hold of us. We work out our salvation. Given only by faith. We continue to look up and forward. Not back and down. Knowing that others around us and the world will try to influence us to give up. But we've decided that our citizenship is in heaven. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing Someone said it this way I heard recently, I really like. If you are constantly looking around at the world, you will be distressed. If you try to get all your answers from within, you'll be depressed. And if you fix your eyes on Jesus and never take them off, you will be 
at rest. That's really good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing chapter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church and now we're here in 2021 receiving from your throne room of grace, Lord. And I thank you, God, that as we've walked down through this chapter, there's more that we could say and, and, and more that we could discuss. But Lord, we're so grateful that Paul is able to take all the things that sometimes vie for our attention. And we think if I would just do that or say that or enter into that or engage in that, that God will love me more to realize those things don't matter to him. He just wants us to come simply by faith. And then we come by faith that we actually have him join us in faith to work out what needs to be worked out. That he's not a father that's standing at a distance with his arms folded. Say, when are you going to work this out, son or daughter? When you work it out, call me. No, he's up close. He's personal. He's within. He is actually engaged. He's apprehended us just like we have apprehended him. He's in the mix the whole time. He is, he is showing. He is, he, he is pointing out. He is saying, get rid of this and take hold of this. And, and he is actually showing us who he is. Oh God, forgive us, Lord, when we get sidetracked into making things so complex when Paul makes it so clear that the ultimate joy is knowing Christ knowing Christ to receive his transforming power that when we suffer we realize Jesus has suffered too in that same vein that we've settled the fact that his life is the only life and therefore we would die in this body and never give up on him that we would even agree to say God if you want to kill me and raise me back from the dead if that helps me to know you better let's do it God we thank you for the apostle Paul that is just pulling out the stops here and he is calling us up and into maturity in Christ so, Lord, we want to enter in. Maybe there's someone here watching online. You say, you know, I've gotten off the path. Today, I want to get back on. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. He already is Lord. It's about us surrendering to his lordship. Maybe there's something that I've said today that, that really took hold of you in a new way you're thinking you know I, I never heard it that way before I never thought about it that way before but I believe that God is speaking to me about that very thing maybe it's a shift in thought or understanding about yourself or God it can be any number of things but probably not many Christ desires us to know him personally, not to be afar off. Maybe there's an adjustment that's needed in your life. Thank you, Father, for speaking to hearts this morning. Again, maybe you're here and say, I, I, I just desire to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want him to enter in. I want him to, I want to surrender. I've heard what you said, and now I want the full, I want to step into this full understanding of what it means to, to get to this ultimate joy and know Christ. 
I'm going to ask you to do a simple thing, and that is raise your hand in a few moments. That really is an indication, but that's just a starting place. That you're raising your hand because you're saying, by faith, I want to enter in. By faith, I enter in. And once by faith, there'll be things that God will have you work out. Not void of faith, but with faith. If you say, I want to make Jesus Lord, just lift up your hand right now. Just lift it up to say, I'm ready to make Jesus Lord, to surrender my life. Anybody here? This morning, give you an opportunity to be born again by faith. Amen. We stand.